Section three of Messengers of Evil by Marcel Alain and Pierre Souvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter four A Surprising Itinerary Jerome Vandor had passed a bad night. Visions of horror had continually arisen in his troubled mind between nightmare after nightmare he had heard all the horrors of the night sound out in the darkness and the glimmering dawn then he had fallen into a heavy sleep which had left him on awakening broken with fatigue he had given himself a cold douche and this had calmed his nerves then he had dressed quickly when eight o'clock struck he was at his writing-table thinking things over it's no laughing matter i thought at first that the dolan affair was quite ordinary but i am mistaken the warning i received last night leaves me no doubts on that head since the guilty person thinks it necessary to ask me to keep quiet it is evident he fears my intervention if he is afraid of that it is because it must be hurtful to him if disastrous to him a criminal it is evident that it must be useful to honest folk my duty then is to go straight ahead at all costs there was another motive besides this of duty which incited him to follow more closely the vicissitudes of the rue norvins drama a motive still indefinite vague but nevertheless terribly strong jerome fondor had sworn to elizabeth dolan that he would get at the truth he recalled the girl's entreaty her emotion and when he closed his eyes now and again he seemed to see before him the tall graceful fair and fascinating sister of the vanished artist all fondor would admit to himself was a chivalrous feeling towards her elizabeth dolan was worth putting himself out for that was all our journalist spent the entire morning seated at his writing-table his head between his hands smoking cigarette after cigarette arranging his plans for investigating the dolan case what i have to find out is how the dead man left the depot the first impossibility to be explained yes and how am i to set about it suddenly fandor jumped up marched rapidly up and down his room whistled a few bars of a popular melody and in his exuberant gaiety attempted an operatic air in a voice deplorably out of tune there are eighty chances out of a hundred that i shall not succeed cried he but that still leaves me twenty chances of arriving at a satisfactory result let us make the attempt as fondor was hurrying off he called to the portress in passing madame audre i don't know whether i shall be back this evening or no perhaps i may have to leave paris for a while so would you be kind enough to pay particular attention to any letters that may come for me be very particular about them please fondor went off a thought struck him he turned back he had something more to say to the good woman i forgot to ask you whether anyone called to see me yesterday afternoon no monsieur fandor no one good if by any chance a messenger should bring a letter for me look very carefully at him madame audrey i have a colleague or two who are playing a joke on me and i should not be sorry to get even with them this time fandor really went off having set his portress on the alert in the rue montmartre he hailed a cab to the national library and as quick as you can by jove it's three o'clock and not a minute to lose cried fandor as he got back his stick from the cloak-room of the national library he had handed it in there some hours ago he entered the rue richelieu now for an ironmonger's shop he caught sight of one and went in i should like fifty yards of fine cord please very strong and very pliable said fandor the shopkeeper stared at the smart young man what do you want it for sir i have various qualities without the trace of a smile and as if it were the most natural thing in the world he replied it is for one of my friends he wants to hang himself a shout of laughter was the response to this witticism and the amused shopkeeper forthwith displayed various samples of cords fondor promptly made his choice and left the shop now for a watchmaker's said our journalist he entered a jeweller's close by i want an alarm clock a small one the cheapest you have provided with his alarm fandor looked at his watch again confound it all it's half-past three he cried he signalled to a closed cab 
to the palais de justice as hard as you can lick directly fondor was well inside the vehicle he drew down the blinds took off his coat unbuttoned his waistcoat the great clock of the palais de justice had just struck four and its silvery tones were echoing harmoniously along the corridors when jerome fondor entered the tradesmen's gallery he turned to the right and gained the little lobby in which the cloakroom is he quietly entered it barristers were coming and going full of business throwing off their gowns inspecting the letters put aside during the sittings of the courts fondor made his way among the groups with the ease of custom he seemed to be looking for someone, and finished by questioning one of the women employed in the cloakroom. "'Is Madame Marguerite not here?' "'Oh, yes, monsieur. She is down below.' Madame Marguerite was an old friend of Fondor's. She was head of the cloakroom staff, and by her kind offices she had often obtained an interview for our journalist with one or other of the bigwigs of the bar, who generally object strongly to being questioned by journalists.' when she appeared fondor told her he only wanted a little bit of information from her oh yes i know all about that there is someone you wish to see and you want me to manage it for you no not a bit of it what i want to know is where these gentlemen of the court of justice robe and unrobe i mean the justices of the assize courts this seemed to astonish madame marguerite considerably but monsieur fondor if you wish to interview one of the puisan judges it would be ten times quicker for you to go and see him at his own home here at the palais it's almost certain he will refuse to answer you don't bother about that madame marguerite just tell me where these worthy guardians of order defenders of right and justice divest themselves of their red robes madame marguerite was too much accustomed to our young journalist's ridiculous questions and absurd requests and remarks to argue with him any longer the robing room of these gentlemen said she is in one of the outer offices of the court near the council chamber there is an assistant in that room isn't there yes monsieur fandor ah that is just what i wanted to know many thanks madame and fandor grinning with satisfaction made off in the direction of the court of the assize he ran up the steps leading to the council chamber and spying the messenger asked can president gachon see me do you think monsieur le president has gone Fandor seemed to be reflecting. He gazed searchingly round the room. As a matter of fact, he was verifying the correctness of Madame Marguerite's information. All round the room, Fandor saw the little presses where the men of law kept their red robes. Yes, it was the robing and unrobing room of the Puisan judges, the magistrates, right enough. So the president is gone. Ah, well. Fandor hesitated. He must think of some other name. He noticed the visiting cards nailed to each press, indicating the owner. He read one of the names and repeated it. "'Well, then, could Justice Hubert see me? Could he possibly? Will you ask him to let me see him for five minutes?' "'What name shall I say?' "'My name will not tell him anything. Please say it is with reference to the, uh, Peru case, and I came from Maitre Tissot.' "'I will go and see,' said the messenger, moving off whilst he was in sight fondor walked up and down the regulation way murmuring maitre to salt the peru case go ahead my good fellow you will have a nice kind of reception down below there with those made-up names some minutes later the messenger returned to his post prepared to inform the importunate young man that he could not possibly be received by justice hubert he stopped short on the threshold not a soul was to be seen wherever has that young man got to taken himself off most likely i expect he was one of those lawyers clerks confound them a nice fool i should have looked if his honour justice hubert had said he would receive him with this reflection the messenger went back to his newspaper not without having ascertained that it was four o'clock and therefore he had still an hour to wait before he could have his coffee and cigar at the men of the robe through the great windows of the court of assize carefully closed as they were not a ray of moonlight filtered into the courtroom and this obscurity lent an added terror to a silence as profound as the grave a silence which with the falling shades of night assumed possession of the vast hall where so many criminals had listened to the fatal sentence the sentence of death when the court had risen the assistants had as usual proceeded to put the place in order then the police sergeant had made his rounds and had gone away, double-locking the doors behind him. 
after this the chamber had gradually sunk into complete repose a repose which would be broken the following morning when the bustling routine of the legal day commenced once more little by little too the many and varied noises which had echoed and re-echoed the whole day through in the galleries of the palais de justice had died down and sunk into silence the custodians had made their last round the barristers had quitted the roaming room the poor wretches who had slunk in to warm themselves at the heating apparatus in the halls had shuffled back to the cold street and the whistling blasts of the north wind the immense pile was entirely deserted a clock began to strike then hardly had the last stroke of eleven sounded awakening the echoes of the empty galleries than in the court of assize itself under the monumental desk before which the justices sat in state by day a noise made itself heard long strident nerve-wracking the noise of an alarum clock just as the alarum ceased its raucous call a loud yawn resounded through the empty spaces of the chamber the sleeper who had selected this spot that he might indulge all undisturbed in a revivifying sleep evidently took no pains to smother the sound of his voice for after yawning enough to dislocate his jaws he uttered aloud ah oh! he accompanied his yawns with exclamations it's a fact the republic doesn't do things up to the scratch the rugs here are of poor quality i'm aching all over the floor is strewn with peach kernels surely at any rate it's a quiet hotel and one is not disturbed a truly delectable refuge to have a jolly good snore in the sleeper sat up what's the time exactly let us have a light on it a match was struck and a tiny flare of light shone from under the desk of the presiding judge ten past eleven i've still five minutes to be lazy in and i shall need all of it for i've a rough night before me i can rest a while and think things over the speaker calmly lay down again trying to find a comfortable position on what he christened mentally the administrative peach kernels let me see now he went on aloud at five in the afternoon it was known that jacques delon had committed suicide was probably innocent and that his corpse had disappeared yesterday at half-past five la capitale announced that he had a very pretty sister to-night at ten past eleven behold me shut up quite alone in the palais de justice free to proceed to the little investigation i think of making jerome fandor my dear friend i congratulate you you have not managed badly yes went on our journalist what a joke it is here have i got myself shut up in the palais without the slightest difficulty it is true that if the assistant had been obliged to open and verify the contents of all the robing rooms of all the judges he would never have finished as for me and my cupboard i followed all the good fellow's movements and he never suspected my presence if i am to be congratulated he cannot be blamed for it there i was there i remained and now i must be off fondor drew a small wax taper from his pocket and lighted it with a match what's to be done with the alarum he went on to leave it will be to betray my having passed this way what of it in any case even if this reporting job fails i shall make a story out of it and how can they accuse me of stealing if i leave my cloak as a gift for his judgeship laughing fandor piled up the law books lying on the desk and placed the alarum on the top that done he went to the principal entrance the only one with double doors he seized the heavy iron bar placed across the door and worked it loose he drew the two leaves of the door toward him and although it had been locked as usual he effected his escape after a considerable trial of strength out on the stairs lighted taper in hand the laughing fandor closed the two leaves of the door with the utmost care and went forward whistling a marching tune his objective was a certain little staircase leading to the top story of the palais and this he mounted with vigorous determination there was no likelihood of chance encounters for there was not a soul in the vast building the police were making their rounds outside it our adventurous journalist did not make his way upwards with stealthy tread there was no need for that having gained the top floor he went straight to a corner where an ebony ladder was ensconced a ladder which had long been the joy and pride of the grand master of this part of the palais the amiable monsieur peter pretty heavy grumbled fandor as he carried it upwards under the roof he caught sight of a skylight rested his ebony ladder against it and climbed briskly on to the roof 
From thence Fondor had a view that was fairy-like. Spread out in the distance were the sparkling lights of Paris. He was divided from them by the vast mass of roofs about him, by a gulf of empty space, and beyond, by a dark blur, the two arms of the Seine flowing on either side of the Palais de Justice. The mysterious darkness, the fascination of the sparkling points of light. Fondor gave himself a mental shake. This was no moment for dreaming under the stars. From his pocket he took a tiny folding dark lantern. From his pocket-book he drew a paper, which he spread out and proceeded to study. As he bent over it he murmured, A bit of good luck that I was able to get hold of a complete and detailed plan of the Palais de Justice. Without it I never could have found my way among these roofs. He examined the plan for some minutes, made a note of various landmarks, then, refolding it, he gained one of the sloping roofs facing the quay of the leather-dressers now thought fandor i must be just above the depot and now to find out how jacques delon dead or living has got out of the depot no use thinking of a window for the cell has not got one fusilier has reason on his side when he declares that you do not get out of the cells of the depot nor out of the palais well now to carry off delon dead or living by way of the palais square or by the boulevard is out of the question there are too many people about to carry him off by one of the exits on to either of the quays is equally out of the question there are the sentries in the first place and then comes the seine then jacques delon has left the depot or he has not or at any rate he is still somewhere in the palais unless fandor interrupted his cogitations to light a cigarette smoking helped him to think things out it is equally certain that if delon is still in the palais he cannot be in the depot for the depot has been rigorously searched since his disappearance and he would most certainly have been found had he been anywhere about the depot it is also certain that he is not inside the palais because the only means of communication between the depot and the palais is a single staircase and it is certain that a corpse could not have been taken that way unperceived then it follows that jacques delon must have got out by the only ways which are in communication with the depot that is to say the drains and the chimneys how could he have got out or been got out by the drains as far as i know there is no system of pipes large enough to allow of the passage of a man through the pipes which join the main sewers but as a set-off to that there is a chimney the ancient chimney of marie antoinette which communicates with the depot and the roof i am now on it must have been by this chimney that the escape was made let us see whether this is so or not by the light of his tiny dark lantern fandor studied afresh the plan of the palais and tried to identify the various chimneys about him he soon picked out the orifice of marie antoinette's chimney after a considering glance at it he remarked that's odd here is the only chimney whose opening is below the ledge of the roofs it is certain that unless one had been warned and had examined this roof from some neighbouring building the orifice of this chimney would not be noticed if jacques delon passed out by it no one would notice his exit our journalist continued his examination full of excitement surely he was on the right track ah ah here are stones freshly scraped and scratched he cried delightedly and this white mark is just the kind of mark which would be made by a cord scraping across the wall and look what a size this chimney is it's not only one jacques delon who could pass out by it but two but three a whole army aha i believe i am on the right track now for it fandor bent over and looked down the interior of the chimney and at the risk of toppling over he managed to reach something he saw shining in the darkness of the opening he drew himself up radiant by jove there are irons fixed in the walls of the chimney to climb up and down by and what is more they bear traces of a recent passage the rust has been rubbed off here and there yes it is by this way dolon has come out to whom else could it be an advantage to use this as an exit from the interior of the palais on to the roofs fandor was keen on the scent here indeed was matter for an article which would bring him into notice good business for a journalist if delon had been alive reflected fandor it is evident that once on the roofs he had a choice of three ways to escape he could do what i have just done but the other way about 
he could break a skylight jump into a garret and lie hidden under the tiles awaiting the propitious moment when he could gain the corridors below and mingling with the crowd slip unobserved into the street or he could hide among the roofs and stay there or he could search for an opening one of those air holes which put the cellars and drains in communication with the exterior but i have come to the conclusion that dolon is dead then his corpse could only remain up here or it has been put down into some place where nobody goes the garrets of the palais are so incessantly visited by the clerks and registrars that no corpse could remain undiscovered in any of them therefore either jacques dolan's corpse is somewhere on the roofs of the palais or there is some sort of communication between the roofs and the drains it is obvious evidently the next step was to search every hole and corner of these same roofs armed with revolver and lantern fandor started on his tour of investigation but prudently for he was now almost certain that there were a number of accomplices involved in this delon affair to go carefully over the enormous roof of the palais de justice was no light task one has only to consider the immensity of this monumental pile its complicated architecture the numberless little courts enclosed within its vast confines to understand the difficulties with which our intrepid journalist had to contend but jerome fandor was not the man to be discouraged in the face of difficulties he was determined to brave them conquer them he examined minutely the entire roofing of the palais he did not leave a corner or a morsel of shadow unexplored there was not a gutter which he had not searched from end to end when after two hours of strenuous exertion he returned to his starting point the chimney of marie antoinette he was fain to confess that if jacques dollon had mounted to the roof of the palais de justice he certainly had not remained there fandor unfolded his plan once more it fluttered in the night breeze as he carefully numbered all the chimneys opening on to this roof then one by one he identified them with the real chimneys before his eyes he exclaimed joyfully there now it's just what i suspected he had discovered there was one chimney not down on the plan whither did it lead at all costs he must find out make sure he hastened to this extra chimney its orifice was large enough to allow of the passage of a man also here again stones had been recently loosened and a rope had rubbed against them what the deuce is this chimney thought fandor another mystery this chimney is not a chimney there is not a trace of soot in it even old soot after a moment's reflection he added can it be for ventilation only but a ventilation hole could only communicate with one of the apartments in the palais itself and how the deuce could they drop a corpse down there it would have been in the highest degree imprudent to attempt it no it is not by that road they have carried off delon's body but then by what way he glued his ear to the chimney after a while fandor could make out a vague intermittent sound could catch a little faraway plashing sound can the chimney communicate with the seine he asked himself no we are too far off it why this opening then ah i have it it is a drain a sewer it communicates with to verify that there was nothing for it but to descend the chimney which was no chimney so be it fandor took off his coat and uncovered the long fine cord rolled round and round his middle weighting the cord with a flint he let it slide down the chimney testing the straightness of the descent by the balanced oscillations of the stone and so ascertaining the even size of the opening as far as the line would go this was the work of a few minutes fandor did not hesitate he was eager to embark on the descent after all he murmured though i may find myself face to face with a band of assassins what of it it's all in the night's risks he fastened the end of the cord to one of the neighbouring chimneys fastened it firmly then his revolver handily stuck in his belt fandor seized the cord twisted it round his legs and let himself slowly down through the narrow opening it was a perilous descent fandor did not know whether his cord was long enough and lost in the darkness with only the gleam of light from his lantern to guide him he was naturally afraid of reaching the end of his rope unawares and of falling into the black void beneath but what he observed in the course of his descent excited him so much that he almost forgot the danger he was running 
to those at all practised in police detective work it was clear as daylight that men had passed this way and recently here is a dislodged stone muttered fandor and here are scrapes and scratches fresh and that mark looks like blood pushing his knees and his shoulders against the wall to support himself and stay his movements he examined the mark there was no doubt possible fandor's sharp eyes in the lantern's light had picked out a little red patch which sullied one of the projecting stones in the chimney walls this reflected our amateur detective only confirms delon's death if the wound that caused this mark had been made by a living body the mark would have been larger and there would have been others for it must come from an abrasion of the skin made during the descent it is not a mark made by flowing blood but by blood crushed out he descended a few yards further here's a find he cried he had just perceived some hairs sticking to the rough surface of the stones again with arched shoulders and bent knees he supported himself against the wall examined his discovery left half the hairs where they were took the rest and carefully placed them in his pocket-book the police must not be able to say that i have arranged this for their benefit fandor remarked cost what it may if i do not come across delon's corpse below i must find out to-morrow whether these hairs resemble his fandor went on descending and first in one place then in another he saw on the walls of this chimney whitish patches such as might have been caused by the passage of a heavy mass or body hanging at the end of a rope and striking against the walls on its way down whilst he still believed himself to be some distance off the end of his downward journey he felt a point of resistance beneath his feet at first he mistook it for firm ground much to his surprise he was about to leave go of his cord when a remnant of prudence restrained him how do i know there is not an abyss depths upon depths below me down into the very bowels of the earth i had better take care what fandor had taken for firm ground was nothing but an iron staple projecting from the wall fandor seized it stopped for a minute or two's breathing space ascertained by drawing it up that of his cord there were only a few yards remaining but he also perceived and with what relief that from where he was resting downwards the chimney was as far as he could see by his lantern's light marked off into regular spaces by these iron staples which are sometimes placed there for the use of chimney cleaners and masons fandor found them a most convenient kind of ladder the descent now became easy and in a short time our adventurous journalist reached the bottom of the chimney at first he could not understand where he had got to in the thick gloom around him his lantern's gleam of light showed him a kind of vaulted wall of massive masonry he had advanced a step or two with noiseless tread listening on the alert not a sound could he hear he decided to expose the full light of his lantern the brighter light showed him that the chimney from which he was now standing some yards away ended in a kind of sewer evidently no longer in use and the plashing sound he had heard on the far up heights of the palais roofs proceeded from a thin and muddy stream of water flowing in the middle of the sewer channel in the direction of the seine kneeling at the foot of the chimney fandor could distinguish marks of steps made by human feet much deeper and very different indentations were visible also not only have men passed this way but a short while ago he murmured but they were carrying a heavy burden there are two kinds of footmarks made by two kinds of shoes and the heels have made much deeper marks in the soil than have the tips yes these men bore a heavy burden fandor was so pleased that he mentally rubbed his hands over his discovery his quest was a success so far he was on the track of dolan's body and what copy for la capitale then a sad thought came to dim his delight poor poor elizabeth dalon i swore to her i would get at the truth and a lamentable truth it is her brother is dead he died in the depot he was done to death it was no suicide whilst talking to himself fandor was scrutinizing every inch of the ground as he moved forward there might be fresh clues it's a queer kind of sewer he went on this streamlet is as much mud as water it is almost stagnant evidently this underground sewer way is no longer used has been abandoned a horrid spectacle struck him motionless his lantern made visible a struggling heaving mass of rats fighting tooth and claw enormous rats devouring some hidden thing fontor's stomach rose at the sight 
Oh, horror! Could it be Jacques Dollon's body? Fandor snatched up a stone and flung it furiously among the unclean beasts. They fled. On the ground he could distinguish a mass, a red formless mass, saturated with congealed blood. Assuredly, if the corpse has disappeared, it is there the assassins must have cut it in pieces, that they might carry it more easily, and those vile creatures are in the thick of feasting on the poor victim's remains. Pah! Fondor moved on, only to discover another pool of blood, almost as large, also besieged by rats. Evidently I shall find nothing else, thought Fondor. The corpse no longer exists. He continued his advance, determined to find out what this underground way ended in. His lantern was flickering to a finish when he arrived at the end of the sewer and found, as he had foreseen, that its opening had been cut in the steep bank of the Seine. "'That's a bit of luck. I can get out this way instead of having to climb back the way I came, up to the Palais roof and down again.' It was still night. Darkness reigned, save on the far horizon, where a faint whitish line indicated the early dawn of an April day. Fondor was just asking himself by what gymnastic feat he could regain the quay, and he was leaning over the opening of the sewer, his body bending far forward over the inky waters of the Seine. Before he had time to turn, before he could regain his balance, a brutal blow from behind half stunned him, and a vigorous thrust precipitated his body into the Seine. End of chapter 4 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com I Evolve Messengers of Evil by Marcel, Elaine, and Pierre Souvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins Chapter Five: Mother Toulouche and Cranajour. Come along, Cranajour. Let's have a sight of what they've given you for the frock coat and the whole outfit. The person thus challenged rummaged in the pockets of his old, much patched and filthy garments, and after interminable fumblings and huntings, finished by extracting a certain number of silver pieces, which he counted over with the greatest care. Finally, he replied, "Seventeen francs, Mother Toulouche." mother toulouse showed her impatience it's details i want how much for the coat how much for the whole suit i've got to know i tell you i've got to write it all down and i've got to see how much i've to hand over to each of the owners of the duds try to remember cranajour the individual who answered to this odd appellation reflected after a silence shrugging his shoulders he replied i don't know i can't make myself remember not anyhow and it's a long time since I sold the goods. Mother Toulouse shrugged in turn. A long time, she grumbled. What a wretched job. Why, it's only two hours since. Barely that. It's true, she went on with a pitying look at the shabby down-at-heel fellow who had spread out his seventeen francs on the table. It's true that you're known not to have two hapworths of memory, and that at the end of an hour you have forgotten what you've done. Well, that's right enough answered cranajour let's have done with it then cried mother toulouche she held out a repulsive-looking specimen of old clothes be off with you go and pawn this academician's cast-off when the comrades catch a sight of this bit of stuff to the fore they'll understand they can come without danger no cops about the store on the lookout are there mother toulouche took the precaution to advance to the threshold of her store cast a rapid glance around not a suspicious person nor a sign of one to be seen a good thing muttered she but i was sure of it those police spies are going to give us some peace for a bit likely the whole lot of them are on this dolan business isn't it so cranajour as she retreated into her store again mother toulouche knocked against that individual who had not budged he had hung over his arm respectfully the miserable bit of stuff that had been styled an academician's robe. "'Well, what are you waiting for?' asked she sharply. "'Nothing.' "'What are you going to do with that?' Cranajour seemed to reflect. "'Haven't I told you,' grumbled Mother Toulouche, "'to go and stick it up outside? Don't say you've gone and forgotten already.' "'No, no,' protested Cranajour, hastening to obey orders. 
what a specimen thought mother Toulouche, whilst counting over the seventeen francs cranajour was a remarkably queer fish beyond question how had he got into connection with mother Toulouche and her intimates that remained a mystery one fine day this seedy specimen of humanity was found among the comrades exchanging vague remarks with one and another he stuck to them in all their shifting from this place to that no one had been able to get out of him what his name was nor where he came from for he was afflicted with a memory like a sieve he could not remember things for two hours together a feeble-minded poor sort of fellow with not a halfpenny's worth of wickedness in him always ready to do a hand's turn for any one to judge by his looks he might have been any age between forty and seventy for there is nothing like privations and misery to alter the looks of a man faced by this queer fish with a brain like a sieve they had christened him cran ajour and the nickname had stuck to this anonymous individual besides was not cranajour the most complacent of fellows the least exacting of collaborators always content with what was given him always willing to do his best as to mother Toulouse, she kept a little shop on the quay of the clock the sign over her little store read for the curiosity lover this alluring title was not to be justified by anything to be found inside this store which was nothing but a common pick-up-anything shop it was a receptacle for a hideous collection of lumber for old broken furniture for garments past decent wear for indescribable odds and ends where the wreckage of human misery lay huddled cheek by jowl with the beggarly off-scourings of parisian destitution behind the store whose little front faced the edge of the quay and looked over the seine was a sordid back shop here the pallet of mother Toulouche, a kitchen stove out of order and the overflow of the goods which were crowded out of the store were jumbled up in ill-smelling disorder this back shop communicated with the rue de harlay by a narrow dark passage thus the lair of old mother Toulouche had two outlets nor were they superfluous in fact they were indispensable for such as she ever on the alert to escape the inquisitive attentions of the police ever receiving visitors of doubtful morals and thoroughly bad reputation mother Toulouche's quarters comprised not only the two stores but a cellar both large and deep to which one obtained access by a staircase pitch dark crooked and everlastingly covered with moisture owing to the proximity of the river the floor of the cellar was a kind of noisome cesspool one slipped on the greasy mud floundered about in it for all that this cellar was almost entirely filled with cases of all kinds with queer-looking bundles with objects of various shapes and sizes evidently the jumble store of mother Toulouse did not confine itself to the rough and ready shop in the front and into the bargain this basement might be used as a safe hiding place in an emergency a precious refuge for whoever might feel it necessary to cover his tracks and thus escape the investigations of the police for instance mother Toulouse, as a matter of fact needed such premises as hers if she took ceaseless precautions it was because she had a reason for her uneasy watchfulness mother Toulouse had already come into involuntary contact with the police and her last and most serious encounter with them went as far back as those days of renown when the band of numbers had as their chief the mysterious hooligan lupart also known under the name of dr chalec she had been arrested for complicity in a banknote robbery had been tried and had been sentenced to twenty-two months imprisonment footnote four see the exploits of juve not turned in the slightest degree from the error of her ways and possessing some money which she had kept carefully hidden mother Toulouse had decided to set up shop close to the palais de justice the great house where those gentlemen of the robe judged and condemned poor folk she would say being so close to the red-robed i shall end by making the acquaintance of one or two of them and that may turn out a good job for me one of these days but this was merely a blind for other considerations had led to mother Toulouse renting this shop on the isle of the city in opening on the quay of the clock a quay but little frequented her wretched jumble store of odds and ends she had kept in touch with the band of numbers which had gradually come together again as soon as the various numbers of it had finished serving their time 
For a while they had lived unmolested, but lately misfortunes had laid a heavy hand on the group. Still, as the band began to break up, other members came to replace those who had disappeared, either temporarily or for good and all. At any rate, they could safely count on the assistance of an individual more valuable to them than anyone. This was a man named Nibet, who, although he intervened but seldom, could, thanks to his influence, save the band many annoyances. This Nibet held an honorable official position. He was a warder at the depot. Whilst Mother Toulouche, from the back of her store, was watching with a derisive air the good-natured chronicler fasten up the academician's robe in a prominent position on the front of her nondescript emporium, someone stepped inside and warmly greeted Mother Toulouche with a, "'Good day, old lady!' It was Big Ernestine, who explained volubly that for a good half-hour she had been prowling about near the statue of Henry the Fourth, keeping the store well in view, but not daring to approach until the usual signal had been displayed. Those who frequented the place knew that when the store was under police observation and Mother Toulouse feared a raid, she took care to hang out any kind of old clothes. But if the way was clear, if no lurking police were on the lookout, then the rallying flag would be hoisted, the flag being the old patched, rusty, musty academician's robe. Footnote 5. See The Exploits of Juva. Ernestine had arrived looking thoroughly upset. "'Have you heard the latest?' she cried. "'The bad news?' "'What news? Whose news?' questioned Mother Toulouche. "'Why, that poor Emilet has come down a regular cropper!' "'The poor fellow! He isn't smashed up, is he?' Mother Toulouche lifted her hands. "'I haven't heard anything more than what I've told you.' Consternation was on the faces of the two women. Their good Mimile, he who knew how to take care of himself without leaving a comrade in the lurch, who stuck to them, working for the common good. A few years previous to this, Mimile, having refused to conform to military law, had been arrested in the tavern of a certain Father Corn during a particularly drastic police raid, and the defaulting youth had been straightway put under the penal military discipline administered to such as he. Instead of making himself notorious by his execrable conduct, as those in his position generally did, he behaved like a little saint. Having thus made a reputation to trade on, he was twice able to steal the money from the regimental chest without a shadow of suspicion falling on him, and, what was worse, two of his innocent comrades had been accused of the crime, had been condemned and shot in his stead. Owing to his good conduct, Mimile had been transferred to a regiment stationed in Algiers, and, having a considerable amount of spare time on his hands, he got into close touch with the aeroplane mechanics. He was very much at home in this branch of work. Could not Mimile demolish a lock as easily as one rolls a cigarette? He was daring to a degree, and, as soon as his time in the military was up, he began to earn his living as an aviator, and rightly, for he had become an able airman. Nevertheless, Mimile, become Emilette, had aspired to greater things. A humdrum honest livelihood was not to his taste. He had come to the conclusion that, provided he went warily, nothing could be easier than to carry on a lucrative smuggling trade by aeroplane. He could fly from country to country under the pretext that he was out to make records in flying. Custom-house officials and police inspectors in the interior would never think of examining the tubes of a flying machine, to see whether or no they were packed with lace, nor would it occur to them to overhaul certain cells fore and aft to discover whether things of value had been secreted in them, such as thousands of matches or false coin. So, from time to time, Mimile would announce that he was off on a trial trip to Brussels from Paris, from London to Calais, and so on. For mechanics, Mimile had two broken-down sharpers, who served as connecting links between the aviator and the band of smugglers and false coiners who gathered at the lair of Mother Toulouche under the seal of secrecy. This was why Big Ernestine was so anxious when she heard of Mimile's accident. Had the aeroplane been totally wrecked? Would the very considerable prize of Malign's lace they were expecting reach its destination safe and sound? For some time past, ill luck had pursued them had seemed to pursue implacably these unfortunates who took such pains and precautions to carry through their unlawful operations to a successful issue. 
already the cooper a member of the confraternity who had had his glorious hour in the famous days of chalec and lupart had scarcely left prison retirement before he had been nabbed again owing to the far too sharp eyes of the french custom-house officials on the belgium frontier others of the band were also under lock and key again it really seemed as if mother Toulouche and her circle were being strictly watched by the police and now here was Amelette, who had come a regular cropper in his aeroplane no doubt about it mother Toulouche was set on knowing the rights of it but what has happened to Amelette exactly she called cranajour the queer fellow came forward from the back store where he had been loafing he had a bewildered air cranajour said mother Toulouche, putting a sou in his hand hurry off and buy me an evening paper now be quick about it don't forget make a knot in your handkerchief to remind a stupid head oh don't be afraid mother Toulouche, declared cranajour i shan't forget he nodded to big ernestine and vanished as by magic into the darkness for night had fallen scarcely had cranajour gone than a surly-looking individual slipped into the store not by the quay entrance but through the back store to which he had gained access by the dark passage leading to the rue de harley his collar was turned up as though he were cold his cap was drawn well over his eyes thus his face was almost entirely hidden having barred the door on the quay side of the store mother Toulouche joined big ernestine and the newcomer well nibet anything fresh she asked removing his cap and lowering his collar nibet's crabbed visage glowered on the two women it was the depot warder right enough bad he growled between his teeth things are hot right at the palais things to worry about to do with comrades committed for trial questioned big ernestine nibet struggled and threw a glance of disdain at the girl you're going silly it's this delon mess up the warder gave them an account of what had happened the two women were all ears as they followed nibet's story of events which had thrown the whole legal world into a state of commotion incomprehensible occurrences which threatened to turn an ordinary murder case into one of the most mysterious and most popular of assassination dramas mother Toulouche and big ernestine were well aware that nibet knew much more than he had told them about the details of the dolan vibray affair but they dared not cross-examine the warder who was in a nasty mood nor did the announcement of Amelette's accident add to his gaiety it just wanted that he grunted and those bundles of lace were to turn up this evening too who is to bring them asked big ernestine the sailor declared nibet and who is to receive them demanded mother Toulouche. i and the beetle answered nibet in a surly tone come to think of it went on nibet staring hard at big ernestine where is that man of yours the beetle like someone who had been running at top speed cranajour who had been gone about an hour on his newspaper buying errand drew up panting before the dark little entry leading from the rue de harley to the den of mother Toulouche. he slipped into the passage but instead of rejoining the old storekeeper he began to mount a steep and tortuous staircase which led up to the many floors of the house he climbed up to the seventh story turned the key of a shaky door and entered an attic whose skylight window opened obliquely in the sloping roof this poverty-stricken chamber was the domicile of the queer fellow who passed his daylight hours in the company of mother Toulouche, hobnobbing with a hole and corner crew cronies of the old receiver of stolen goods overheated with running cranajour unbuttoned his coat opened his shirt sprinkled his face and the upper part of his body with cold water sponged the perspiration from his brow and brushed the dust off his big shoes it was clear starlight to-night to freshen himself up still more he put his head and shoulders out of the half-opened window he was gazing at the roofs facing him suddenly he started and his eyes gleamed they were the roofs outlined against the night sky of the palais de justice there was a shadow on the roof of the great pile a shadow which moved to and fro passing from one roof ridge to another now vanishing behind a chimney now coming into view again anxiously cranajour followed the odd movements of the mysterious individual who was making his lofty and lonely promenade up above there what the devil does it mean soliloquized the watcher whoever could have seen cranajour at this moment would have been struck by the marked change produced in his physiognomy 
this was not the chronosaur of the wandering eye the silly smile the stupid face known to mother toulouse and her cronies it was a transformed chronosaur mobile of feature lively of movement a sharp keen-witted chronosaur veritably another man puzzled by the vagaries of the promenader on the palais roofs chronosaur followed his movements intently for a few minutes longer he would have remained at the window the whole night long had the unknown persisted in his peregrinations but chronosaur saw him climb to the top of a chimney a wide one lower himself slowly into the opening of it and then vanish from view chronosaur waited a while in hopes that the unknown would not be long in coming out of his mysterious hiding-place again he waited and expected in vain the roofs of the palais resumed their ordinary aspect solitude reigned there not long afterwards chronosaur re-entered the back store what a time you have been cried mother toulouche you've brought the newspaper haven't you chronosaur looked at the little company with his most stupid expression and then lowered his eyes my goodness i've forgotten to buy one he cried nibet who had paid but scant attention to the new arrival continued his conversation with big ernestine they were talking about her lover nicknamed the beetle he was a terrible individual this beetle though his nickname suggested a peaceful occupation he really owed it to the frightful reputation he had won as a bell-ringer but the bells big ernestine's lover was in the habit of ringing were unfortunate pedestrians whom he would rob and half murder beating them unmercifully about the head and body sometimes he would beat them to within an ace of their last gasp occasionally he would beat the life out of them altogether if they tried to resist his brutal attacks the beetle was an apache footnote six hooligan of the first order of brutality big ernestine finished explaining to nibet that he must not count on the beetle that evening for things were so queer and uncertain the outlook was so gloomy that no one knew what bad business they might be in for mother toulouche asked if he had got mixed up in the delon affair chronosaur cocked his ear at that whilst pretending to put a great bundle of old clothes in order but nibet replied the beetle has nothing whatever to do with that business i know what i know about all that he's afraid of getting what the cooper got so he keeps away he's not far out either you've got to be careful these days queer times ernestine and mother toulouche bewailed the cooper's fate poor fellow no sooner out of quad than back only a fortnight's liberty and with a vile accusation fastened to him smuggling and coining nibet tried to relieve their minds haven't i told you growled he that i'm going to get maitre henri robart to defend him he knows how to get round juries he'll get the cooper off with an easy sentence nibet looked at his watch it will soon be half past two got to go down the boatman will be there before long at the mouth of the sewer mother toulouche who was always in a flurry when smuggled goods were to be unloaded in her cellars tried to dissuade nibet you'll never be able to manage it by yourself nibet glanced at cranajour the warder hesitated then said since there's no one else couldn't i take cranajour with me at first objections were raised there was a low voice discussion so that the simpleton might not catch what they were saying cranajour had never been up to dodges of this kind so far he had been kept out of them besides he was such a senseless cove he might give things away make a hash of it nibet smiled why it's just because he is such a simpleton and because he hasn't a mite of memory that we can use him safely that's true said mother toulouse somewhat reassured she called to cranajour come along cranajour and just tell us where you dined this evening the simpleton seemed to make a prodigious effort of memory seized his head between his hands closed his eyes and racked his brains after quite a long silence he declared emphatically and with a distressed air faith i can't tell you now nibet who had closely watched this performance nodded it's quite all right he said the cellars below mother toulouse's store were extensive dark and ill-smelling the walls glistened with exuding damp and the ground was a sticky mass of foul mud of all sorts of refuse of putrefying matter nibet followed by his companion made his way down to them it was no easy descent for they had to climb over cases of all kinds and over bales and bundles that moved and rolled about 
they passed into a smaller cellar around which were ranged long boxes of tin with rusty covers cranajour who had been given the lantern to carry was attracted to these boxes he lifted the cover of one of them and drew back wonderstruck for the box was full of shining gold pieces nibet with a jab and thrust in the back interrupted cranajour's contemplation of this fortune nothing to faint over he growled you're not such a simpleton then you know the value of yellow boys all right then i'll give you one or two if you do your job all right but continued the warder leading his companion to the further end of the second cellar you will have to look out if you present your banker with one of those pieces for the little bits of shiny won't pass everywhere you've got to keep your eye open and jolly wide too cranajour nodded comprehension false money false money he murmured there was a very strong big door an iron bar kept it closed nibet raised it with cranajour's help through the door the two men passed into a long passage swept by a sharp rush of air the floor of it was paved and at the side of it flowed a pestilential stream carrying along in its slow-moving water a quantity of miscellaneous filth it was thick as soup with impurities a little collecting sewer of the cité whispered nibet pointing to a grey patch in the distance he put his mouth to cranajour's ear see the daylight yonder that's where the sewer discharges itself into the seine it's there the boatman and his load will be waiting for us presently nibet stopped dead drew cranajour back by the sleeve and stepped stealthily backwards to the massive doors of the cellar an unaccustomed noise had alarmed the warder in profound silence the two men stood listening intently there was no mistake the sound of sharp regular steps could be clearly heard coming from that part of the sewer opposite the opening someone said cranajour who was all on the alert as he had been in his attic watching the shadow and its vagaries on the roofs of the palais de justice nibet nodded the light from a dark lantern gleamed on the damp slimy walls of the subterranean passageway come inside murmured nibet in an almost inaudible voice and with infinite precaution he closed the massive portal between the cellar and the sewerway in safe hiding the two men could watch the approaching intruder they had extinguished their lantern and were peering through the badly joined wood of the solid door friend or foe an individual moved into view the reflected light of his lantern lit up the vaulting of the sewerway and showed up his face the man was young fair wore a small moustache hardly had he passed the cellar door when nibet gripped cranajour's arm and growled intense rage was expressed in grip and tone it's he again the journalist of the delon affair of the depot business jerome fandor ah this time we'll see nibet's hand plunged into his trouser pocket cranajour was eagerly watching the warder's every movement he clearly heard the sharp snap of a pocket-knife a long sharp knife a deadly weapon giving prudence the go-by nibet had opened the door and dragging cranajour in his wake had rushed into the sewer-way hard on the heels of the journalist who was slowly going in the direction of the seine nibet ground his teeth i have had enough of that beast always on our track too good a chance to miss i'm going to make a hole in his skin for him in the twilight of early dawn which penetrated the sewer near the opening cranajour shuddered with stealthy step the two men drew near the journalist fandor walked on unsuspicious at a slow regular pace his head lowered the two bandits came up to within a yard of him noiselessly savagely determined nibet lifted his arm for a murderous stroke at this precise moment fandor stopped at the verge of the exit by which the sewer discharged its burden steeply into the seine yet a moment nibet's knife was poised for the rapid and terrible stroke it was about to bury itself into the neck of the journalist up to the hilt when cranajour lifted his foot as if inspired by an idea on the spur of the moment gave the journalist a violent kick in the lower part of the back and sent him flying into space they heard his body fall heavily into the sin so roughly sudden had been cranajour's movement that nibet stood dumbfounded arm in air and staring at cranajour cranajour smiled his most idiotic smile nodded but did not utter one word it was formidable the rage of nibet here had that crass fool cranajour kicked away the warder's chance of ridding himself of the journalist for good and all this hit and miss made nibet foam with rage 
of all the exasperating simpletons this fool of a chronosaur took the cake the two made their way back to the store where mother Toulouche and big ernestine anxiously awaited the results and now not only had the two men returned stuttering over their statements and with no news of the boatman who was generally up to time but they had missed a fine opportunity chance had offered them nibet hated the journalist like all the poisons taunts jeers abuse were heaped on the silly head of chronosaur who all in vain raised his eyes to heaven beat his chest shrugged his shoulders stammered mumbled vague excuses he didn't know exactly why he had done it he thought he was helping to bet they disputed and contended for two hours suddenly chronosaur broke a long silence and demanded looking as stupid as a half-witted owl what have i done then what are you scolding me for mother Toulouche and big ernestine and the wrathful nibet stared at one another taken aback then they understood two hours had gone by and chronosaur no longer remembered what had happened decidedly he was more innocent than a newborn babe there was nothing whatever to be done with such an idiot that was certain end of chapter five read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggy bark dot blogspot dot com six of messengers of evil by marcel elaine and pierre Silvestre. this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter six in the opposite sense when jerome fandor had been precipitated into the seine so unexpectedly and with such violence he kept control of his wits he did not utter a cry as he fell head foremost into the darkling water he was an excellent swimmer all aching as he was he let himself go with the current and presently reached the sheltering arch of the pont neuf there he took breath for a minute queer was all he murmured then with regular strokes he made for the steep bank of the seine opposite quitting the river he secreted himself behind a heap of stones which lay on the quay he took off his soaked garments and wrung the water out of them this done and clad in what looked like dry clothes fandor walked along the quay hailed a passing cabman half asleep on his seat jumped inside and gave his address to the jehu when he arrived at la capitale on the friday morning a boy approached him and whispered mysteriously monsieur fandor there's a very nice little woman in the sitting-room who has been waiting for over an hour she wishes to see you she will not give her name she declares that you know who she is what is she like fandor asked his curiosity was not much aroused pretty fair all in black replied the boy good i'll go in interrupted fandor he entered the sitting-room and stood face to face with mademoiselle elizabeth dollon she came forward her eyes shining her face alight with welcome oh monsieur she cried taking his hands in hers a movement of pure gratitude oh monsieur i knew you would come to my help i have read your article of yesterday thank you again and again but i implore you since my brother is alive tell me where i can see him for mercy's sake don't keep me waiting surprise kept fandor silent a moment la capitale had published the evening before a sensational article by fandor in which under the guise of suppositions and interrogations he had narrated the various adventures as they had happened to himself concluding with the question really an ironical one if jacques dollon who had disappeared from his cell where he had been left for dead had escaped from the depot by way of the famous chimney of marie antoinette had reached the roof of the palais had redescended by another passageway to the sewer opening on to the seine did it not seem possible that dollon had escaped alive from the depot fandor had indulged in a gentle irony despite the gravity of the circumstances in order to complicate the already complicated affair and so plunge the police into a confusion worse confounded this in spite of his conviction that dollon was dead dead as dead could be now the cruelty of this professional game was brought home to him his article had raised fresh hopes in dollon's poor sister at sight of this charming girl brightened with hope fandor felt all pity and guilt he pressed her hands he hesitated he was troubled he did not know how to explain 
at last he murmured it was wrong of me mademoiselle very wrong to write that article in such a way without warning you beforehand alas you must not cherish illusions illusions which this unfortunate article has given rise to illusions i cannot believe in myself i speak with all the sincerity of which i am capable with the keenest desire to be of service to you i dare not let you buoy yourself up with false hopes i assure you then that from what i have been able to learn to see to know i am convinced that your unfortunate brother is no more if there have been moments when i had doubted this i am now morally certain that he is dead take courage mademoiselle try try to forget to to fandor was trembling with emotion he could not continue elizabeth bent her head her eyes full of tears she could not speak she was overcome by this cruel dashing to the ground of her hopes never never to see her brother again an agonizing silence reigned fandor was profoundly troubled by this mute grief he sought in vain for some word of comfort of encouragement elizabeth rose to go the poor girl realized that nothing could be gained by prolonging the interview her one need now was to be alone for then she could weep fandor was about to accompany her to the door when a boy entered monsieur fandor there's a man wishes to speak to you say i am not here replied our journalist he had no wish to see strangers just then but monsieur fandor he says he is the keeper of the landing stage of the passenger boat service and he comes with reference to the delon affair both elizabeth delon and jerome fandor started she was trembling our journalist said at once bring him in then the boy went off and fandor turned to the trembling girl tell me mademoiselle elizabeth do you feel equal to hearing what this man has to tell us it is not improbable that he has seen something something it would be best you should not hear had you not better avoid it elizabeth shook her head in the negative she was collecting all her forces she would not remain ignorant of any detail of the terrible tragedy which had cost her brother so dear i shall be strong enough she announced firmly the boy ushered in the visitor he looked a good specimen of his class a man about forty on his cap were the gold anchors of those in the employ of the paris boat service monsieur madame at your service the good fellow was very much embarrassed monsieur fandor he went on you do not know me but i know you very well that i do i read your articles every day in la capitale they're jolly good what i say is fandor cut short his admirer now tell me what brings you here oh well here goes i was reading your article yesterday about how jacques delon no more dead than you or i had escaped over the roofs of the palais de justice that made me laugh because i am the keeper of the landing stage at the pont neuf station this affair is supposed to have happened in my parts don't you see well i had just come to the bit where you also supposed that the corpse might easily have been devoured by rats inside the sewer well monsieur fandor i can assure you that it was nothing of the sort the journalist was all eyes and ears he signed to elizabeth that she must keep quiet so as not to intimidate the good fellow come now what is it you have seen what i've seen why i saw the lawn break bounds at this statement elizabeth grew white as a sheet she jumped up and with clasped hands rushed towards the keeper speak speak quickly i implore you she cried fandor drew elizabeth back gently and whispered a few words to her he turned to the keeper mademoiselle has also come to make a statement regarding this affair he explained that is why she is so interested in what you have just told us but tell us how you saw jacques delon escape well i had got up a bit earlier than usual to see that the anchors and mooring were all right and i thought i saw what looked like a big bundle fall into the river from the sewer opening only i was half asleep and didn't take much notice for what with all the rain we've been having there's no end of filthy stuff tumbling out of the mouth of the sewers but a few minutes after that i noticed that the bundle instead of going with the flow of the current was drifting across the seine plainly making for the bank there could be no mistake about that elizabeth delon cried and then and then then my little lady what if this surprise packet didn't turn off behind an arch of the pont neuf i didn't see what became of it but no one will get it out of my head that it isn't some jolly dog who had no wish to show himself that's what i think 
the keeper paused then went on that's all i have to tell you monsieur fondor it might serve for one of your articles some time or other only you mustn't say that i told you i might get into trouble with my chiefs about it elizabeth dolan was no longer listening she had turned to fondor and with shining eyes murmured he lives he lives fondor thanked the keeper and got rid of him directly the door closed behind him he darted to elizabeth poor child he cried full of pity for her ah don't pity me i don't need your pity now my brother is alive that man has seen him fondor had to undeceive her your brother is certainly dead he declared if he were the individual in question it would not have been yesterday morning but the morning before that when the keeper saw him and i do assure you but this good fellow is telling the truth then i assure you that i have good reasons the best reasons for believing for being certain that the swimmer who crossed the seine was not your brother great heaven who was it then fondor hesitated a moment should he divulge his secret all he said was it was not your brother i know that so decisive was his tone so great the sympathy vibrating through his words that elizabeth dolan once more convinced that fondor was not speaking at random bent her head and shed tears of deepest grief and bitter disappointment fondor allowed the sorrow-stricken girl to give way to her grief for a few minutes then he gently asked her mademoiselle elizabeth shall we have a little talk you see i simply cannot tell you everything yet i would gladly help you but first and foremost i beg of you to put quite out of your mind this hope that your brother is still alive sadly elizabeth wiped away her tears and in a voice which she tried to steady said oh wh what is to become of me i thought i had found in you a support a help and now you abandon me and i had put my faith in your goodness of heart there are your articles on the one hand and your attitude on the other what am i to make of it it is driving me to despair and if you only knew how much i need to be supported encouraged i feel as if i should go out of my senses out of my mind and i am alone so terribly alone the poor girl's voice was broken by sobs her whole body was shaken by them fondor went up to her and spoke to her in a low tone affectionately he felt great sympathy and an immense pity for this unhappy young creature who charmed and attracted him he tried to console her and to change the current of her thoughts come now mademoiselle do try to control yourself a little i have promised to help you and i certainly shall you may be sure of it but consider now if i am to be of real use to you i must know a little about you you yourself your family your brother who your friends are and who are your enemies i must enter into your existence not as a judge but as a comrade who is interested in all that concerns you will you not confide in me once i know what there is to know we might then unite our efforts to some purpose and find out what really has happened since the mystery remains inexplicable elizabeth dolan felt the young man was sincere and that what he said in such a gentle voice was true this poor human waif asked no more than to be allowed to cling to whoever would take pity on her and be kind she now spoke to jerome fondor of her childhood without suspecting in the least that the same jerome fondor charles rambert used to play with her in those days footnote seven see fantomas she mentioned the assassination of the marquise de langrune the first tragic episode of her life then had come the horrible death of her father old steward dolan who had passed from the service of the marquise to that of the baroness de vibray then perished the victim of a criminal she explained how jacques dolan and she had come to settle in paris feeling themselves rich on the savings they had inherited from their parents. Elizabeth had become a dressmaker, and Jacques had become an artist craftsman. Gradually the young man's talent and industry had enabled his sister to leave her workroom and come to live with him. His reputation was a growing one, and the two young people looked forward to an existence of honest comfort in the near future. They got to know some people, one or two of whom were rich, and had shown their interest in the brother and sister jerome fandor interrupted her you always remained on good terms with the baroness de vibray at this question the girl's eyes flashed they have put into print shameful things about this poor dear baroness and about my brother also the papers have represented her as eccentric as mad they have said worse things than that you know that don't you 
they have declared that there was a very intimate relation between her and my brother i cannot say more it is too hateful it is all false as false as false can be the baroness was particularly interested in jacques but assuredly that was owing to the long-standing relations between her family and ours the suicide of the baroness has been a sad addition to my grief for i was very fond of her fondor had been listening attentively to elizabeth's story he now said you have used the word suicide mademoiselle do you then really think as every one seems to do that your patroness killed herself of her own free will elizabeth reflected a minute before replying that was what she wrote and one must believe that nevertheless nevertheless elizabeth hesitated passing her hand over her forehead then said nevertheless monsieur fandor the more i think over this death the more remarkable it seems the baroness de vibray was not the kind of person to commit suicide even if she were unhappy even if she were ruined i have often heard her speak of her money affairs she even used to joke about the expostulations of her bankers monsieur's barbet nantul because she was too fond of gambling that was our poor friend's weakness she was a dreadful gambler she was always betting on horses and gambling on the boars footnote eight stock exchange do you know the barbie nantules at all mademoiselle a little i have met them once or twice at madame de vibray's when she had one of her little evenings once or twice my brother has asked their advice about investments very modest investments i can assure you and they got one of their friends a monsieur Tomery, to buy some of my brother's art pottery have you many acquaintances in paris mademoiselle besides the baroness we hardly saw anyone except madame bourrat a very nice kind woman widow of an inspector of the city of paris she keeps a boarding-house at a tulle rue Raffette. in fact i am staying with her now for i had not the courage to go back to my brother's place too many dreadful memories are connected with his studio there i am lucky to find such a sympathetic friend in madame bourrat and such a warm welcome i am alone now and life is sad fandor went on with his cross-examination nevertheless mademoiselle i must ask you to return in thought to that tragic home of yours please tell me what people you knew in your immediate neighbourhood acquaintances elizabeth considered acquaintances is the word because we were not on really intimate terms with our neighbours in the cite for the most part they are either art students or work people however we saw fairly often a nice man a stranger a dutchman i think he was called monsieur van huren he manufactures accordions and lives in a little house opposite ours with six children he has been a widower for years also there was a monsieur louis an engraver who used to take tea with us in the evening sometimes his wife also he is employed in the posts and telegraphs we had practically no other acquaintances elizabeth stopped there was a silence fondor asked another question tell me mademoiselle when you entered the studio for the first time after the tragedy did you notice anything abnormal the poor girl shuddered at the appalling picture before her mind's eye good heavens monsieur she cried i did not examine the studio minutely i had only one thought to be with my brother who had been so unjustly accused so fondor interrupted to ask do you not know that in his preliminary examination your brother declared that he had not received a single visitor during the evening preceding the tragedy how then do you explain the fact that the baroness de vibray was found dead in his studio and at his side when no one had seen her enter it did your brother make a mistake please tell me what you think about it elizabeth gazed anxiously at the young journalist then fixed her eyes on the floor her hands twitched she began to twist her fingers feverishly do trust me begged jerome fandor please tell me what you think elizabeth rose took several steps and placed herself in front of the journalist ah oh, monsieur there is something mysterious which i cannot explain as a matter of fact someone must have come to see my brother that evening i cannot assert it as a fact beyond dispute certainly but in my own mind i feel quite sure about it but you must have more proof of it than that cried fandor there is more cried elizabeth as if enlightened by a sudden discovery there is a fact tell me do cried fandor intensely interested well just imagine then among the papers scattered over his table and close to his book which was open 
i noticed a sort of list of names and addresses written on our own note-paper and in the kind of green ink we use so well so interrupted the journalist you came to the conclusion that this list had been written at your brother's house yes and it was not my brother's handwriting nor that of the baroness de vibray nor that of the baroness de vibray and what did this list contain names addresses i tell you of persons we knew there were also two or three dates and is that all that is all monsieur i saw nothing else little enough murmured fandor disappointed still no detail however slight must be ignored what have you done with that list mademoiselle i must have taken it with me when i collected all the papers i could find the day before yesterday before going to the boarding-house at atul when you have an opportunity will you bring me that list requested fandor the conversation was interrupted a boy came to tell fandor that he was wanted on the telephone by someone in the public prosecutor's office later on in the day jerome fandor sent the following express message to elizabeth delong do not believe a word of the police headquarters version which you will read in this evening's la capitale this dispatched our journalist commenced his article entitled still the affair of the rue Norvans." police headquarters takes a view of this affair which is the very reverse of that taken by our contributor jerome fandor by the seine sewer the roofs of the palace and the chimney of marie antoinette an inspector has succeeded in reaching the depot police headquarters is convinced that jacques dolan escaped alive end of chapter six read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com of messengers of evil by marcel elaine and pierre Silvestre. this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by don w jenkins chapter seven pearls and diamonds nadine princess nadine what time is it the young circassian with hair as black as ink supple and slender rose from her chair and was hastening from the bedroom to ascertain the time when her mistress recalled her don't go away nadine stay with me the dusky circassian obeyed she stared with big astonished eyes into those of her mistress but princess why don't you wish me to go the princess stammered in a mysterious tone don't you know then nadine that today is the anniversary and i am frightened princess sonia danidoff was in her bathrobe it must have been a quarter past eleven or even nearer midnight than that although she had lived in paris for years she had never been able to make up her mind to settle in a flat of her own possessing an immense fortune she much preferred the american way of living and had taken a suite of rooms in one of those great palace hotels near the place de l'autoile though a very smart staff of servants was reserved for her exclusive use her favourite attendant was a pretty circassian in whom she had absolute confidence this nadine was a native of southern russia the movement of city life and civilized manners and customs had at first terrified this little savage but she had learned to adapt herself to her changed surroundings and was now high in the favor of princess sonia she and she alone was authorized to be present when the beautiful great lady took her daily baths for some years past the princess had insisted on the presence of a maid when she took her baths without fail they must either be in the bathroom itself or in the room next to it within reach or call but on this particular evening sonia danidoff more nervous and restless than usual would not allow nadine to leave her for a second as to the time well if she did not know the exact time it could not be helped really it did not matter to her whether she were half an hour or no for the ball given in her honour by Tomery, the millionaire sugar refiner in fact it would be much better to make her appearance after all the guests had assembled her arrival would give the crowning touch of brilliancy to this society function sonia danidoff had pronounced the word anniversary in a tone of anguish so sincere that nadine was genuinely alarmed she knew only too well what this fatal word meant to her mistress 
she had not forgotten that five years ago to the day just when the princess was enjoying her evening bath a mysterious individual had appeared before her who after frightening her had robbed her of a large sum of money the adventure would have been little out of the ordinary for hotel robberies are frequent had not the audacious bandit been quickly identified as the enigmatic and elusive fantomas whose prodigious reputation had only increased with the passage of the years sonya danidoff who was not ignorant of the dramatic adventures imputed to this legendary hero could not bear to think of the position she had been placed in that awful night when threatened and robbed by fantomas she had escaped death by a series of unknown and unguessable circumstances the tormenting mystery of it all preyed insistently upon her mind since then sonya danidoff had never taken a bath without thinking of fantomas and every year when the anniversary of his aggression came round she suffered cruelly she was seized with wild unreasoning fears at the idea that she might see this terrifying bandit appear before her again and that this time he would be merciless nadine knew all this she also shuddered at the vision this horrible anniversary evoked but controlling herself she was anxious to change the current of her dear mistress's thoughts forget try to forget sonya danidoff she counselled in her melodious voice you are going to a ball at monsieur thomery's at your fiance's house the princess shuddered ah nadine my nadine she cried raising herself and regarding her maid with a strange look i cannot overcome my uneasiness my alarms this coincidence of date agitates me you know how superstitious we are at home in our russia and the life i lead in paris has not destroyed in me the simplicity of soul of a daughter of the steppes nadine did not know what reply to make to this pathetic outburst the princess went on and then do you see i think it wrong of monsieur thomery to even want to give this ball only a fortnight after the tragic death of that poor baroness de vibray i tried to dissuade him from it i think the baroness was his most intimate friend once so it is said murmured nadine sonya danidoff went on as if speaking to herself i am not sure of it it is precisely to remove this suspicion from my mind that thomery was determined to have his ball to-night at all costs the baroness de vibray so he told me was no more than a good old friend i cannot make her death an excuse for putting off the announcement of our marriage that would be to give colour to the scandal sonya danidoff shrugged her beautiful shoulders hand me a mirror nadine obeyed the princess gazed long and complacently at the marvellously lovely face reflected in the glass princess cried nadine you must leave the bath you will be late otherwise in the adjacent dressing-room brilliantly illuminated by electric light the princess dressed with the aid of nadine proud and happy to be the sole assistant of her beloved mistress the toilette was a triumph silk of an exquisite blue draped with silk muslin encrusted with pointe de venise and bands of ermine a costly masterpiece of the dressmaker's art it enhanced the brilliant beauty of sonya danidoff and threw nadine into raptures the princess opened her jewel box this evening nadine i shall be pearls and diamonds cried the lovely creature as she fixed two large grey pearls in her ears oh how beautiful you are princess and what a lot they must have cost cried nadine ten thousand francs my child on each side of my head sonya slipped on her fingers three diamond rings set in platinum and here are eight or nine thousand francs more continued she as nadine's eyes grew round with wonder her mind could hardly grasp all these thousands of francs worth of diamonds and pearls there were still more to come for rejecting a magnificent bracelet on the plea that one no longer wore them at balls the princess smilingly bade her circassian fasten round her neck a superb triple collar of pearls to this was added a sparkling cascade of diamonds never had nadine seen her beautiful mistress so richly dressed thus adorned in nadine's eyes sonya danidoff was dazzlingly beautiful exquisitely lovely you look like the holy virgin on the icons stammered nadine kneeling before her mistress quite overcome by emotion good heavens that is blasphemy i am only a humble human creature said the princess smiling then she once more looked at herself in the mirrors well satisfied with her appearance certain of the effect she would produce on her future husband thomery 
she threw over her shoulders a superb mantle of zibeline which was quite needed for though it was the middle of april it was quite cold then ready at last she descended to her motor-car and was whirled away to the ball cranajour cranajour mother toulouse shouted herself breathless she tried to shout louder and louder it was in vain she might shout herself hoarse there was no reply the old termagant who had left the front of her hovel and had gone to call her assistant shouting in the passage at the back of the store returned cursing and swearing and seated herself near the store in the lean-to which did duty as a kitchen where in devil's name has that imbecile got to she grumbled whilst sipping with gusts from the bottom of a cup into which she had poured a small allowance of coffee and a copious ration of rum it was about eleven in the evening there was not a sound to be heard having finished her rum and tea the old receiver of stolen goods went to the entrance of the passage cranajour cranajour yelled the old termagant there was no answer he can't possibly be in his canteen said mother toulouche to herself if he was he'd have answered fool though he is and would have come down sure he's going to drag his old down at heels somewhere but where oh well we can manage to do without him the old receiver went back to her store and was starting on a queer sort of job when the door which led on to the quay burst open before a panting breathless individual he ran right up the store and stopped short mother toulouche had seized the first thing she could find and had taken up a defensive attitude her weapon was a great ancient cavalry sabre but the newcomer intended no harm quite the contrary after an instinctive recoil he leaned against the table and wiped his forehead breathing in gasps incapable of pronouncing a syllable mother toulouche had recognized him ah it's you redhead and not a bit too soon either i've been waiting for you this last half hour ernestine will be there in ten minutes time however is it you are so late redhead was well named his bullet head was covered with russet red hair cut very short his complexion was a good match his bloated cheeks and his potato-shaped nose were covered with red patches his shaven chin was a tawny red round his little gimlet eyes was a fringe of red lashes it was a bestial face he was hatless above his waistcoat with metal buttons he wore a black coat his trousers had a yellow line down them he was evidently a servant wearing the livery of some big house the fellow was slowly recovering his breath but he continued to wipe great drops of sweat off his narrow forehead he was shaking all over and his morose countenance was twitching and contracting nervously well what's your news good or bad questioned mother toulouche in a brutal tone redhead replied almost inaudibly that depends it's good on the whole a gleam of cupidity showed in the old receiver's eyes got a bit of tin on her back that woman eh redhead nodded with a yes thereupon mother toulouche went back into her back store and returned with a claret glass filled to the brim with rum shoot that down your throat that'll put you right when he had swallowed the bumper he seemed to gain courage and said if i didn't get here sooner it's because i had to wait but i saw the little thing what's her name nadine replied redhead and added a pretty little brat too she's got some fire in her eyes what's that to do with it interrupted mother toulouche you don't mean to tell me you were able to make her gabble a bit she queried contemptuously redhead bridled likely since i know everything now and i'm her sweetheart let me tell you mother toulouche said in a jeering tone you don't tell me you oh replied redhead it's just a way of speaking she's a good little thing there's nothing to it you know so much the worse declared mother toulouche virtuous sorts aren't any use to our lot well what did she tell you out with it well said redhead i waited three quarters of an hour before nadine joined me i had no bother in making her talk i can tell you without the asking she told me everything she was pretty well flabbergasted with all the jewels her mistress had stuck on her clothes and her skin seems there's hundreds of thousands worth all pearls and diamonds nothing but mother toulouche was calculating real pearls real diamonds it's possible there's all that worth steps could be heard on the pavement just outside redhead began to shake all over who is it he asked someone coming in mother toulouse grinned be easy then haven't i told you there's nothing to fear nevertheless he asked anxiously there's nothing more i'm wanted for here is there 
I've told you all I know. No, no, it's all right, replied Mother Toulouche, maternal and conciliating. There's nothing more for you to do here. Still, if you want to see big Ernestine... Without waiting to hear the end of her sentence, Redhead hurried toward the exit. Mother Toulouche did not try to detain him. After all, she said in a low tone to his back as a kind of farewell, cut your sticks, my lad, since you're funky. When alone, she grumbled aloud. What a lot they are! I never did! White-livered and for nothing at all! Mother Toulouche was still muttering when big Ernestine marched in through the back way. She had on a large hat and was heavily veiled. She proceeded to remove both hat and veil. Well, she queried, they've got on to it all right. Redhead has just gone. He knows through the little maid that the princess went off to the ball dressed up to the nines, hung with jewels like a shrine. Big Ernestine uttered a deep sigh of satisfaction. Her only reply was to hustle the old receiver. Look alive, Mother Toulouche. You've got to give me a beggar's outfit. It's up to you to see I'm disguised properly, and there's not a minute to lose, either. Mother Toulouche was an expert at disguises and make-up of every sort. This was not to be wondered at, considering the queer company she kept and the fraudulent business she carried on, and the smuggling she was mixed up in. Big Ernestine, disguised as a poverty-stricken creature and rendered unrecognizable, looked exactly like some unfortunate reduced to soliciting alms. She walked into the back store and helped Mother Toulouche to take from a cupboard some bottles, bandages, and medicated cotton wool. By the light of a smoky lamp the two women scrutinized the labels, sniffing the various files and flasks. Big Ernestine, with the aid of Mother Toulouche, prepared compresses of pomade and cotton wool, on which she sprinkled a few drops of a yellow liquid, giving out a sickening odor. Besides this, Big Ernestine put inside her bodice a long file, after making certain that the mixture, with which it was full, contained chloroform. Then, under Mother Toulouche's watchful eye, Ernestine prepared what was called in that world of light-fingered gentry, the mask. A mask of cotton, which is molded by force on the face of the victim in order to plunge him or her into a heavy sleep. Whilst making these sinister preparations, the two women talked as they went on with their evil task. Big Ernestine said, in reply to Mother Toulouche's questionings, Oh, it's simple enough. It's like this. When the motor car stops, I shall go to the right-hand door and begin to beg. Likely enough, the princess won't want to hear what I have to say, but while I attract her attention, Mimille, who will be on the other side, will open the door and will stick the compress on her mug. She won't struggle. Besides, Mimille will have hold of her, and then I'll have had time to see where her jewels are, and how they are fastened, and then I'll soon have them in my pocket, my deepen. Mother Toulouche nodded. It's arranged, all right. But how will you arrest the motor? Oh, that's where the others come in. They'll do it all right. I expect they're seeing to it now. But look here, cried Mother Toulouche. Mamille isn't in bits, then? They said he had fallen from his flyer. Big Ernestine gave a laugh. He fell right enough, poor little fellow, and from pretty high, too. But he's not broken a thing. Not this time. A bit of luck, I don't think, eh? He's a mascot, I'm certain, declared Mother Toulouche. Then she said, You spoke of the others? Who are they, the others? But didn't they tell you? cried the surprised Ernestine, for she thought old Mother Toulouche was in the know. Why, there's the beetle and the beard. Oh, cried Mother Toulouche, much impressed. If the beard's in it, then it's a serious affair. Yes, replied Big Ernestine, staring hard at the old receiver of stolen goods. It's serious, all right. If the chloroform doesn't work, oh, well, they'll bring the knife into play. Big Ernestine looked at her little silver watch to mark the time. Past midnight, she remarked. I must hurry off and see what they're up to. As she was making off, Mother Toulouche stopped her. Have a glass of rum to start on. It puts heart into you. The two women were quite ready for a drink together. When they had swallowed their dose, Big Ernestine smacked her tongue. Famous stuff. It puts a heart into you and no mistake. Yes, it's the right stuff. The best, agreed Mother Toulouche. It's what Nibbit prefers, she added. Then she cried. But, Nibbit, how isn't he in it? Big Ernestine put a finger on her lips. Nibbit's in it, of course, as he always is. You know that, old Toulouche. But he's content to show the way. You know, he seldom does anything himself. Besides, it seems he's on duty at the depot tonight. Big Ernestine threw an old shawl over her head and went off crying. I'm off and in for it now. Soon be back, Mother Toulouche. The magnificent mansion of Tomery, the sugar refiner, overlooked the Parc Monceau, 
It was approached by a very quiet little avenue in which were a few big houses. It opened onto the boulevard Malasherbes and was known as the Avenue de Valois. All the dwellings there are sumptuous, richly inhabited, and if the avenue is peaceful and silent by day, it is no uncommon thing to see it of an evening crowded with carriages and luxurious motor-cars, come to fetch the owners away to dinners and entertainments. On this particular evening, the approaches to the Avenue de Valois were full of animation. Motors and broughams succeeded one another in a long file, putting down the guests of Tomery under an immense marquee, covering the steps leading up to the vestibule. All the smart world had been invited to the reception. All Paris swarmed into the brilliantly illuminated entrance halls of the mansion. Two mounted policemen sat as immovable as bronze caryatids on either side of the entrance, whilst the swarm of policemen made the carriages move on, and drove away from the aristocratic avenue de Valois the band of poverty-stricken and ragged creatures who crowded the pavement with the hope of securing a handsome tip by opening a carriage door or picking up some fallen object. It was no easy matter to keep order. One of the police sergeants, accustomed to ceremonial functions, remarked to one of his younger colleagues, "'I've seen balls and receptions enough. Well, my boy, this Tomery affair is as fine a set out as if it were at the President's.' Although it was one o'clock in the morning, both on the boulevard Malasherbes and at the entrance to the Rue de Monceau, there was movement and activity. If, as seemed likely, there was a crush in the great reception rooms of the Tomery mansion, it was certain that outside the crowd had to form up in line to get near the counters where the wine sellers were serving their customers without a moment's intermission serving them with drinks of every description thus there was a hubbub there was noise and roistering clamour all around most of the chauffeurs coachmen and servants knew one another mingling with all this aristocracy of the servant class were pickpockets mendicants obsequious and wheedling who offered themselves as understudies to these of the upper ten of the servant world, and these aristocrats were ready to seize this chance of a little liberty, and at the same time play the generous patron to these poor failures in life's battle. In fact, they gave more generous tips than their masters, for did they not rub shoulders with misery and thus realize only too vividly the measureless horrors of destitution? Ernestine and Mamille lost themselves in the noisy crowd. They were all eyes and ears for everything going on around them, whilst keeping in view their two accomplices, the beetle and the beard. This was more than usually difficult, because they were disguised almost out of recognition. The beard was muffled in a blue blouse and a big soft hat, which gave him the look of a peasant, who had wandered into a crowd with which he had nothing in common. The beetle was capitally disguised as a coachman in good service, who was out of a situation, but who from vanity and custom sports the emblems of office. He was continually chewing a quid of tobacco, for such is the habit of coachmen who cannot smoke on their seats, and thus console themselves with two sous' worth of roll tobacco. The beetle stopped beside a chauffeur who had just got down from his car, a magnificent limousine lined with cream cloth, while its exterior was a dark maroon in the best taste. "'Why, it's Casimir!' cried the beetle, going up to the chauffeur, with hands outstretched and smiling face. Mechanically, the chauffeur, addressed as Casimir, responded to the offered hand-clasp, but after a short silence he said in a questioning tone, quite frankly, "'I cannot recall you.' "'Can't you remember me?' cried the beetle. "'Why, don't you remember Cesar? Cesar, who was with Rothschild last year?' No, Casimir could not remember, but he was quite willing to believe that he knew César, for he had seen and known so many since he had been in the service of Princess Sonia Danidoff, that there was nothing extraordinary about his forgetfulness. Besides, César looked quite a decent fellow, and had a taking face, and one only had to look at that beaming countenance of his to be sure that an invitation to take a drink together would soon be forthcoming. The beetle, satisfied that he had so easily made a friend of the chauffeur of Sonia Danidoff, whom he had only known by sight for the last forty-eight hours, did in fact suggest their taking a glass together. The beetle had indeed come up to expectations. Drink was Casimir's besetting sin. Excellent chauffeur, solid and serious fellow as he was, he had two defects. He was addicted to tippling, though he never drank to excess, and never got drunk. Also, he was fond of a gossip. 
he could talk for hours without stopping. The beetle had been posted up regarding Casimir's little weaknesses and tastes. Thus nothing was easier than to set trap after trap, into each of which the simple fellow fell as they were set, fell fatally. The beetle, introducing the beard to Casimir under the name of Father India Rubber, an old codger whose trade was to buy and sell tires to chauffeurs, tires new and also second-hand. At this moment a young ragamuffin appeared on the scenes. He asked if he might be left in charge of the car. It was Mamil. The young hooligan, who had followed the conversation of the three men, and of Casimir in particular, whilst keeping in the background, now intervened at the right moment. He made his offer just as the chauffeur was looking about him in hopes of finding some poverty-stricken creatures into whose charge he could give his car. Casimir gave him twenty sous as an earnest of what was to follow in the way of coin, saying, "'Take great care of my little shanty. Don't let anyone come mooching round it, and when I return you shall have double what you've just had.' "'Thank you, mister,' cried Mamil, bowing low before the chauffeur. "'You may rest assured I shall keep a good lookout.' Mamil exchanged signs of understanding with his two accomplices, whilst they, talking as they went, drew the innocent Casimir towards the nearest tavern, which was crowded with wine-bibbers. Mamil, as faithful guardian of the limousine, soon got bored, although Big Ernestine was prowling around and came to have a minute's talk with him now and again. They dared not be seen together too much for fear of attracting attention. As time went on, Mamil was surprised that neither the beetle nor the beard came to report progress. But at long last the majestic outline of the beard was seen at the corner of the Rue Monceau. The pretended seller of India rubber was coming out of the tavern. He hastened to Mamil, and, in a low, distinct voice, he gave some hurried instructions, for now there was no time to lose. That idiot would never get done with his stories about motor-cars and all that stuff and rubbish. What's that to us? But... Keep your ears open now, Mamil. It seems there are still fifteen liters of petrol in the tank, and that would take it a long way, for the motor consumes very little. But this shanty has got to stop about five hundred yards from here, at the corner of the Rue de Monceau and the Rue de Teheran. It's by this way Casimir will take his baroness back from the ball. Well, what you have to do is to take fourteen liters and a half from that tank and pitch them in the gutter. When Casimir finds that his petrol has given out, he will have to go in search of more. It's during his absence that we will work the trick on the pretty princess. We'll perform an operation on her and amputate her jewelry. The whole lot. The beard drew from under his blouse an empty bottle, which he had stolen in the tavern. Here's your measure. Count carefully fourteen liters and a half. That done, wait quietly till Casimir turns up. Your part in the story will be forty sous, and not to rouse his suspicions. Then, while he goes up to the Avenue de Valois to take up the princess, you and Ernestine have to gallop off to the corner of the Rue de Monceau and the Rue de Tauron, and then wait. Mamil, with the agility of a monkey and the ability of a first-rate chauffeur, for there was nothing he did not know in the way of applied mechanics, as became an aviator, executed to the letter his accomplice's orders. The beard, meanwhile, had returned to the tavern and Casimir. Suddenly all was activity in the world of carriages and coachmen. The great ball was drawing to its end. Casimir was once more in possession of his motor, and had generously tipped his understudy. Thereupon the hooligan had made off as fast as his legs would carry him. Ernestine joined him at the appointed spot. There the two rogues waited. "'Listen!' cried Big Ernestine, some fifteen minutes later. She stared in the direction of the boulevard Malesherbes with neck outstretched and straining eyeballs. At last, after an agonizing wait, she and Mamil saw the carriages driving by. Attention! cried Big Ernestine in a sharp whisper. Everybody's on the move at last! The beetle and the beard, hidden in the crowd which thronged the approaches to the Tomary mansion, awaited the departure of Princess Sonia Danidoff. The idea of this rich prey excited them. Then, as they stared at the first outflow of departing guests, the two bandits could not but notice that far from looking gay and animated as people do who have danced and supped well, these guests of Tomary showed pale, dejected faces. In fact, they had all the appearance of people under the influence of some tragic emotion. "'They look pretty down in the mouth, don't they?' whispered the beard in the beetle's ear. "'That's a fact. You'd think they were returning from a funeral.' Then a vague rumor began to circulate. 
Confirmation followed, spread insensibly within the Tomary mansion, was passed on by the lackeys, spread from the pavements to the avenue. People whispered of incomprehensible things incredible, but which little by little took definite shape. It was said that the Tomary Ball had just become the scene of an accident, of a drama, of a robbery, of a crime. The police, and of the highest grade, had intervened. The news spread like a train of ignited gunpowder. Nevertheless, if Tomary's guests were cognizant of the details, they did not take the beggars and pickpockets into their confidence. Among the light-fingered gentry, conjectures were rife. The beetle and the beard, who tried to catch odds and ends of talk separately, joined each other again, looking crestfallen, discomfited. The beetle broke silence with an oath, adding, I am certain we have been done. Someone has got in before us, been too smart for us. Beard nodded. He was of the same opinion. But who, then, could have had the audacity to plan such an attempt and carry it out, too? who could have had the same idea as he and his comrades and to realize it successfully whoever it was had proved himself the better man in spite of himself the bandit in thought formulated one word fantomas end of chapter seven read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com